Hey, I am Mustafa Sharif, and thank you for listening to Urbanistica podcast. This is the third special episode due to the coronavirus in our cities. Soon I'm going to talk to my guest about how to fix travel and if we really should think about traveling during this time. I have the pleasure to welcome Doug Lansky. Hey, Doug. Hey, hi there. How are you doing? Yeah, well, I'm doing okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm an early adopter, so I went ahead and got the coronavirus uh, and I had it for a couple of days, and oh. now I've been kind of healthy since yesterday. How, how does it feel? Uh, well, like, you know, when it first came on, um, I'd been traveling a lot, and uh, so I, I wasn't particularly you know, f- nervous or afraid of it. I'm kind of in a low-risk category, but it, it came on like one night I was got chills like for 10 minutes before I was going to bed just briefly and I I just didn't think anything of it when I woke up the next day I felt fine I trained for about two or three hours that day uh was out with friends got home at midnight and then kind of in the middle of the night I got chills again uh so about 24 hours later and that time it really stuck and it became fever and chills and sweating and all that stuff and it just kind of took on the like normal flu symptoms for about 48 hours and uh, some coughing, and kind of general body soreness, achiness. And then uh, since yesterday when I woke up, you know, I felt like it had passed. There was no more fever, chills. I just felt kind of tired in my body, and I still feel a little bit like that today, but but better, for sure. Yeah, well, well, get well soon. Thanks. <laughs> Did you go to a hospital, or how was it? No, the way that they advise you to do things here is they just say, don't go to the hospital unless you're about to die. Uh, which means, and and the only place they're going to test you is at the hospital. So there's a lot of people like myself who have very kind of corona-like symptoms who are, you know, just going to be fine after a few days, and we're never really getting tested. So we think we have it, but we're not 100% sure. Um, and we don't go to the hospital because we're not, you know, it's just normal flu. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Well, Doug, let's start with you how would you like to present yourself well i would say so my background is as a travel writer and an editor for 20 years and then i sort of migrated over to consulting for destinations around the world and speaking at conferences so a little bit like a tourism expert and would help them with branding sustainability kind of finding their their unique niche in the world um sort of doing the right thing or taking a longer view of where they want to go with tourism. I don't know, it's kind of a lot, but I mean, it's uh, it's like yeah. rethinking, really rethinking what they want out of tourism and then how to get it. Great. So traveling and tourism is what you're passionate about. Yeah, you can definitely say that. I mean, I've been doing it for so long. <laughs> I, you, I mean, I'm, if you ask me on a given day, I'm more passionate about skiing or running or uh, kite surfing, but... You know, I guess over the the entirety of my career, yeah, my big passion has been travel. Uh, and sh- should we now think about traveling? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's an interesting thing. I was joking uh, just today with some friends that now that I'm a uh, you know unofficial quote unquote Corona survivor, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, that uh, you know theoretically I'm immune we don't know how fast this mutates so like with like kind of a a winter you know vomiting winter crack with winter uh, winter vomiting illness that you can get sick again after even a week or two or three uh where with the flu typically once you've had it you're pretty good for about a year until the next year rolls around they don't think from what i can tell they don't know exactly how fast this one is changing so the the immunologist i spoke with yesterday said i should be good so once if i did in fact get corona I should actually be pretty good to go out and travel or to do whatever and be immune. So it's kind of nice. I feel like I got it over with. Yeah. And now I don't have to walk around worried about being sick in a foreign country. Although, who knows if there's a slightly different strain of it. Mm-hmm. But again, I'm, I'm in a low-risk category. So I think, though, my plan is I'm going to start looking around for travel deals. <laughs> <laughs> You're not, not, non, non-stoppable. Yeah. Many countries and cities, they are locked down. What does this mean? Well, it's, it's unfortunately, it's exactly what it sounds like. I mean, I was just in uh, in France and on the other side of the tunnel from Mont Blanc where Italy was in lockdown. 
and there were people who kind of just made it out. Uh, <laughs> they were telling us that we didn't really want to get too close to them. Um, <coughs> here comes a little of that cough I was mentioning. Um, uh, but it's, it's, I mean, I understand what they're trying to do. And, and this is like the, and I think we, most of us have been following the news, so we sort of get this, which is they're not trying to stop everyone from getting this illness. They understand that the general population is going to get exposed to it, and a lot of people are going to get this. They're just trying to slow it down so it doesn't spike and overwhelm the health services at once. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that's what we're really doing. And I mean, because otherwise, I mean, if you just look at what's happened so far, if we're only looking in hindsight, there's been, what, 7,000 people who've died so far, roughly. That's yeah. how many die in two days in automobile accidents globally. And we don't wow. do much with our behavior with that. That's how many, you know, there's something like 450,000 that die from opioid uh, issues every year. Uh, there's 36,000 who die every year in America from flu, from the flu. There's a hundred, you know, it, there's so yeah. many other things that are horrible that kill way, way, way more people so far. Um, and that we don't, you know, we don't bat an eye at, we don't change our behavior really at all. The gun issues in America and other places, it's, it's insane that we don't take such drastic issues with things like opioids and guns, like we're doing now with the coronavirus. I wish we had bigger actions like this. But yeah. this, this actually, if it goes unchecked, could potentially kill far more people than any of those things. So, I mean, it, it just, we're all waiting to see how infectious it is. Uh, once they get better testing, um, in, in, in terms of how much this is going to, the, you know, the death rate versus how many are affected, we're still getting data coming in and it's all changing yeah. every day. So it's, and we all got plenty of time now that we're all quarantined at home, we can follow the news 24 seven. So we're all yeah. getting inundated with this stuff. Yeah, I, I think countries are taking actions because now it's data collecting and the, the, the numbers are a bit scary compared to the other problems you mentioned. Maybe that's why they are so scared now. The, the potential numbers are there, yeah. The mm. actual numbers haven't gotten there yet, but the potential numbers are scary. Mm. When we mentioned that the countries are locked down, like, are we able to drive from one city to another city or travel by bus? So like in Northern Europe, no, it's in like you can't get in or out uh, and they're not going to let you into the U.S. without a U.S. passport or a green card or a family member or something like that. There are different degrees of lockdown and it's different uh, in different places. Not everywhere is under lockdown and certainly within a country, uh, many places you're able to travel around. But in, even in Northern Europe and Northern Italy, sorry, there's places that are they want lockdown. <laughs> Yeah, in a larger context, where they're having a bigger issue with it. Um, as things get worse, uh, that may, that kind of lockdown may go into place into different levels in different places. I imagine. So many hotels now, and big conferences, and all this infrastructure that's supporting traveling industry now is not working anymore. Well, I don't know. There's certain hotels that are still open and operational, uh, for sure. Many are. Some aren't. Uh, I know, I mean, a lot, the whole industry is having a horrible time. I mean, the ind airline industry here in Sweden just got a bailout. Um, the hotel industry in Italy just got a bailout yesterday. Mm. Um, so, I mean, they're able to keep their doors open, or a lot of airlines are just flying so they can keep their slots at the airports. <laughs> they have yeah. certain time slots they're trying to keep. And, um, you know, now, I can, to be honest, I was just kind of trying to survive the last couple of days. But uh, starting tomorrow, I think I'm going to actually start looking around more to see what places potentially I could travel to. Um, you know, now that I'm feeling immune, I don't want to. I want. Yeah. The tricky thing is, like, this is going to be an interesting and growing group. And those of us who, say, had the coronavirus, uh, we would love to have a test that shows that we actually had it so that we're immune. And yeah. then help us support the travel industry. You know, why wouldn't they? Uh, we can be part of the solution to this thing, those of us who've, you know, gone through it already. So I hope that, I mean, I hope I'm not saying anything wrong. I don't want to sound like I'm, we're going to be spreading things. But I did speak to some doctors yesterday, and they sort of said, yeah, that makes sense. I suppose you could do that. 
so I don't think I'm saying anything wrong when I when I mention that. Which is really great that you now you're <coughs> you're, you're able to tra to travel one more time. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, it just we all are going to get through this. It's just like they're trying to slow it down. And as for those of us who kind of do get through it and go get onto the go to the other side of the coronavirus, then we could start traveling again theoretically. Mm -hmm. I was listening to your TEDx talk and about how to fix the uh, travel <laughs> industry. Uh, how will we fix travel industry after the coronavirus situation? Oof. Well, there's a whole art actually to how destinations can recover after a terror attack or a natural disaster. And this falls into that category. Um, and so one of the things you want to do is is make the destination safe. So like, um, you know, you can say, hey, all of our hotel employees have been tested, our airport hotel, everyone at our destination has been tested, or we we have thermometer testing here and there in every building, you know, whatever it is to make people feel safe uh, with the given issue, whether it's corona or it's a terror attack or something like that. And then the other thing is you have to give people a reason to come back. Um, they learned this in Israel after the second intifada, where they would kind of park tanks in the, in the city center and to show how much safer it was after a terror attack. And that just made people more nervous. What yeah. actually fixed things was when they kept it secure, but they put on some free concerts in town and gave people a reason to come back. They called that policy shining a bright light into a dark spot. Um, wow. So that, that's one thing. Another thing is to not necessarily drop the prices. Um, that might be different with Corona, as it gives people a reason to take advantage of some great deals. Um, but for the most part, people, and, and it also might be hard because people may be economically um, encumbered after a number of months with a dip in the stock market and or a crash in the stock market, and also uh, not having as much work more recently. They may need to lower some prices, but normally, Normally, in those situations, price lowering doesn't do a whole lot. Um, and then the other big thing is to know which markets they should be aiming for. So, for example, Americans are notoriously kind of scared after a terror attack or a natural disaster. We're like the last people to return to a place. But um, in certain markets, uh, usually it's the, the people that are pretty close by. So, for example, in, in the Israeli example, they found that even after a terror attack, um, the Russians and the Italians would be still returning the next day. So after such an attack, they turned off all of their marketing to everyone else and just kept it focused on the Italians and the Russians. So, I mean, I think this is something that a lot of destinations can experiment with, but they need to kind of be thinking in this way in order to, you know, make sure that they get things back on track as quick as possible. Yeah, so it's a kind of re rethink what is the destination they want to, to create or to re recreate, maybe. Yeah, well, yeah, there's that too, the, the, the brand. But I mean, just in terms of who they reach out to and how to project themselves. Mm -hmm. You know who did a great one? Colombia. Colombia did this. You know, Colombia was, a, for a long time, people viewed it was a scary place. Uh, and they had a big change around. They had a great slogan, actually. They said something, their tourism slogan was like, the biggest danger is that you won't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's quite good. <laughs> yeah, they were quite clever with that. Yeah, so I'm thinking this is after the the coronavirus is yeah. let's say gone, but now the big challenge is how to keep the business running. So, what a lot of challenges now. What are the the main things that they should think about, like hotel owners or uh, destinations? Well, it's so different. I mean, that's the thing within tourism. I mean, if you're talking about the automobile industry, you're talking about a handful of automobile makers. In the travel industry, just in a place like Sweden, there's you know tens of thousands of different stakeholders who have totally different business operation models, and they're all going to have to figure out how to scale down and keep themselves above water um, somehow. And there's not like a one-step solution. But I think one of the things is the thing I just alluded to a moment ago, which is that there are people now who have had coronavirus, survived it just fine, and now are feeling immune, and they don't want to sit around quarantined, and they want to go travel and do stuff. So find a way to appeal to us. Let us be your customers. Yeah. 
That so could be one solution. Why not? I'm thinking also, does it mean that now when we have the coronavirus, like we are travel, traveling more locally, like within the country instead of like going abroad? Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of that. And, and for the, a large part of that is that people just don't want to get trapped with new regulations, get stuck in some quarantine and not be able to get home. Yeah. So they're more likely, I think, to travel domestically uh, just to avoid that that problem. As, you know, because I think we, we've seen what's happening is places start clamping down and we don't want to get stuck on the wrong side of the border. Yeah, exactly. That's true. That's true. There should be some positive aspect with all what's happening now for the traveling industry. Well, in what's a way, I mean, it's almost like Greta Thunberg. It's almost like she appeared like Moses and tapped her, her you know, wooden <laughs> staff and said, if you don't stop your traveling, I will send a plague upon you and force you to stop traveling. I mean, it's almost as, like a biblical act. You can almost see Greta with this giant Moses beard and a staff and just say, you know, it couldn't have. This is what's the big effect is that we're not traveling as much. And the global emissions has gone down drastically. They say that they can see this from outer space. Uh, the reduced flights, uh, factory emissions out of China. I mean, it's been bad for us in a way, but great for the planet. Yeah. Uh, Mother Earth is loving this, I hate to say. <laughs> of course. So maybe the, the lesson is that we should change our travel behavior, maybe? Well, it shows that we can when we're properly motivated, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a question of finding the right motivation. Yeah. Let's see. What do you think? How long this going to stay? I mean, there's models and uh, doctors who are much better positioned to answer that kind of stuff than I am. I just think that the one thing I haven't heard them talk about is the people who are coming out on the other side, the people who, who get sick, recover, which is like, you know, 99.5% of the population who is going to just, it's just going to feel like a normal flu. Yeah. They're going to get it. And then as soon as they get it, they're going to go, okay, we got it. Now what? I don't want to sit in my house anymore. Exactly. And, and I think so that's something that I haven't seen included in these models. Um, and that's something I think that could get. And also the other thing is, like I said, all this data is just coming out. Um, we'll see what happens in a month's time when they take And once we get more tests ordered up so they can do a test of the general population, they can see who's had it, who's immune, who's not. Yeah. And then maybe if they feel that enough people have already had it, they can kind of take their foot off the brake a little bit, and if the capacity is enough at that point, um, it may not last. I mean, we don't know. It's so hard to say. Yeah, that's true. Do, that's true. Do you remember? Do you remember after 9/11, everyone was so freaked out, especially in the U.S., freaked out yeah. about flying. So everyone was doing these long driving holidays, and because so many more people were driving, there were more car accidents. In fact, there were yeah. so many more car accidents that something like three or 4,000 people died just in that, three or 4,000 people extra, more than normal, died wow. in car accidents, which is more than died in 9-11. So they had the panic <sighs> and the fear of flying caused more deaths. Our reaction to 9-11 caused more deaths than 9-11 itself. Wow, that, that's that's really, that, that's crazy. Now what you're telling now is super crazy. Yeah, so I mean, there's a chance that our crazy reaction yeah. may be doing something similar and and there there's all these unknowns that come out maybe the stock market crashes and people commit suicide and they go okay that's yeah. going to tip the scales this way or there's all these other factors that are that keep coming out in the news that are going to affect the bottom line of this thing so i just think it's it's scary but also a bit fascinating to see how this plays out mm -hmm. exactly i wanted to ask you as well about what do you think about turning hotels to like a, a mini hospital. I mean, after the when the corona is gone, what is the reputation of this hotel? Like, I think, do you think people will ah. they want to go there or? Interesting. Well, I mean, I think just just to back up one step, I think the reaction in general from the beginning of this thing, you know, outside of say China and South Korea, uh, maybe Taiwan, has been absolutely horrible. I mean, there's been way too few tests. I mean, I've been landing at the airport here in Stockholm countless times and in other airports and going through Amsterdam and no one's been putting a thermometer gun to my head and taking my temperature yeah. anywhere. There should have been so much more testing mm. all over the place and from an earlier stage 
and reducing the amount of travel from a way earlier stage. Like, it really messed this thing up. Um, okay, so now that's whatever. We're, we are where we are now. So exactly. What, what, what to do about it? And, and I think that raises a good question. Do you want to go stay in a hotel that was a coronavirus <laughs> hospital? Yes, <laughs> yes. After this is all passed over? Mm, maybe. I mean, with the right group of people, that could be a big incentive. <coughs> Excuse me, with my lingering okay. virus there. Um, yeah, but with the right with the right group, of people it could be great. It, it could also backfire. That's a real tough call. I mean, maybe. Hmm. I mean, I was thinking more like doing what China's doing, where you put up these tented areas, or you put up these makeshift hospitals, or open up old hospitals, and have those kind of facilities. We don't seem to be doing much of anything to that level of magnitude like they're doing in korea and china with you know drive-through testing and robots patrolling the street and all this kind of stuff um we seem to be a bit behind and hopefully we'll learn something from this and have some preparedness so that the next pandemic that comes through will will get out ahead of it and it won't disrupt our lives as much as this yeah, one has. yeah there are so many lessons to learn from yeah what, that's, what we are going through now I hope we're. Ta I hope someone up in government is taking notes. <laughs> it's not going <laughs> to screw up this badly next time. Let's see if they listen to this podcast yeah, as well. I'm sure they will. Yeah. Well, I will not take much more of your time. I have the last three questions. The first one is, what is the next step for you? Now you told me you're looking for travel trips, right? <laughs> well, I don't. Have, I don't have as many speaking gigs. I had all. Uh, you know, I had like six or seven that got postponed. I have a few more that I hopefully. Hopefully, will not be postponed, um, and so I'll go do those in the summer. Um, if I have a little bit of a, of a sports injury, but I'm hoping to do an Ironman in uh, August in Copenhagen, if that goes well, you know, with the with my injury and with training and all that stuff. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, I'm just working on some different articles and ideas, and, and speaking with different companies. I'm I'm also trying to help regulate Airbnb. Wow. <laughs> some ideas on how to do that really but uh, yeah um or i should say help cities regulate airbnb yeah um i think that the control should be in the cities and that uh and that they can work together in a way with these short-term rental companies and that in the long term that those short-term rental companies will actually do better by letting the cities control mm. the volume of apartment rentals yeah and uh I think that's going to be a better long-term solution. And the question is, what's the best way to create this software solution? But I've been speaking with some people, and it's exciting. But you know, we're not there. We're not even close yet. So yeah, yeah. But but it's gonna gonna be a kind of policy from the municipality. Well, we'll see. It's shaping up in different ways in different places. But I mean, for example, in Barcelona, you know, they're charging something like eighty, ninety thousand euros. If you rent your place illegally without getting a license, but okay. it's it's hard to catch them and it's hard to collect eighty thousand, ninety thousand euros from somebody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> getting them to pay isn't so easy. Yeah. Uh, so there needs to be a better way to do it, and there is. And now we just have to see if we can get all the parties to kind of agree to a common concept. Um, and I think, I mean, I have I have a roadmap of how to get there, and then actually doing it is another thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's great. That's super interesting. Yeah. So there's some fun projects like that I'm working on. Yeah. Uh, keep me busy. Are you, are you going to prepare a lot of material about talking about travel industry and coronavirus or not? That's an interesting point. Um, I've been thinking a lot about it. And I think, I mean, I need to look into this now. I think it'll be interesting as I look in the next coming days, start looking into different travel trip possibilities. I think there's going to be a lot of this post-corona travel. The yeah. people who've got it, where are they going? I think that's going to be a kind of the the new exciting frontier and give people a little bit of a glimmer of hope and keep their help hotels and airlines, you know, keep their lights on and their doors open. Wow. That's my uh, that's yeah. the general idea, but I need to also make sure that the health industry thinks Thinks that that's okay as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sounds we don't very... want to sabotage their efforts. <laughs> exactly. Sounds very promising. Yeah, I hope. Yeah. Uh, if you can summarize, 
were we talking about in three takeaway messages? Uh, today's conversation, I mean, I think uh, it's, it's really like, you know, if you're healthy, it wasn't so bad to survive coronavirus. And, you know, it's 48 hours of unpleasantness, and now it's okay, and I'm glad I got it over with. And hopefully, you know, if, uh, if the government says it's okay, I'd love to start, you know, traveling again, and we could be a big new market for this. And then the other thing I think is that, you know, for, for the different destinations to, you know, figure out how to keep their lights turned on and also how to kind of market to people like me who've now gone through this. Um, and then, boy, you're going to have to help jog my memory uh, on what you feel is the most important stuff. I mean, I think, I think what I'd like to do is get back to helping these destinations, which is, you know, sort of like with my TED Talk video, which yeah. is to figure out what it is that they actually want from tourism. And then once you figure that out, it's a lot easier to get it. A lot of places are walking around just thinking they want more tourists. And that's not actually what they want when you start asking the right questions. Um, so I think that's where I'm really trying to get to is get back to that. And, and we'll get there eventually, hopefully sooner rather than later. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. And also, before we finish, I want three hashtags for this episode. Oh, my God. <laughs> what, what, what's your job in this? Aren't you supposed to be? <laughs> Am I writing all your material for you? Uh, let's see. Uh, hashtag, um, hashtag Corona Survivor. <laughs> uh, hashtag, um, oh, let's see. Hashtag... Uh, <laughs> something like uh, quarantined but not dead or something like that or <laughs> I don't know and what's another one I don't know um, I think something something like uh, <laughs> pray for the stock market I don't know I I, <laughs> I, I, I have no idea you can have some fun with that, but um, I really, yeah. I really hope. For, and I, I, there are some neighbors. I just want to say something, a little quick call out. Yeah, Since when I got sick, my neighbors have been so amazing. They've been bringing over toilet paper and food and putting it on my doorstep, and really amazing. And 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 hopefully this virus kind of brings people together. I mean, this is a huge movement, a collaborative effort to slow this virus together, to help each other out. So hopefully one of the things that come out of this is some good old fashioned neighborly love and a feeling that we're, you know, we're on this planet together and we need to work together to beat this thing. So yes. maybe there'll be some nice lessons like that that come out of this yeah. and uh, go Greta. Yes. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time and I really wish you a great trip. I don't know where you're going next, yeah. but yeah, thanks. Probably somewhere close by. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, doc. Cheers. Take care. And thank you so much for listening to Urbanistica podcast. I am Mustafa Sharif. Have a good life.